Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ann Rudden, and I'm here to introduce and welcome Greg Baer, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. The Los Angeles Times calls Greg Baer one of the masters of speculative fiction. A member of the elite think tank Sigma, Baer has lent his insight to the Department of Homeland Security, the US Air Force, US Army, NATO, and other agencies to provide decision makers with alternative scenarios for critical future developments and events. As a writer of speculative fiction, Bear helps these institutions forecast new developments, brainstorm new technologies, and predict disruptive events. More importantly, he inspires government agencies to consider how these profound changes will affect societies in good ways, uh, bad and unexpected. Greg Bear is here to discuss his new novel, Mariposa, a, quantitative, uh, a Quantico novel. Um, Bear places the US status as a troubled economic and strategic superpower at the center. The country's apparent savior, the Talos Corporation, delivers training for soldiers and runs security forces around the world. But there is a sinister hidden cost. Greg Bear is the author of more than 30 books, including Quantico, Blood Music, The Forge of God, and Darwin's Radio. Bear has been awarded two Hugos and five Nebulas for his fiction, one of two authors to win a Nebula in every category. Bear has served on political and scientific action committees and has advised Microsoft Corporation, the US Army, the CIA, Sandia National Laboratories, Callison Architecture, and other groups and agencies. Please join me today in welcoming Greg Bear. Thank you. Pleasure to be here again. I think the last time I was here was I, I gave a very abstruse talk on information theory and everything, and uh, and I confused the folks here and at Google. And uh, now I'm back to security and thrillers and the difference between science fiction and thrillers and all that sort of thing. Um, I was thinking this morning after reading the news of yesterday is this isn't the future I signed up for. You know, they just shut down the return to the moon, which was a, a dicey proposition. Maybe we'll hear more, and maybe they'll focus on Mars or something. On the other hand, uh, they're handing things over to private enterprise, which is always interesting, especially if there are people there ready to build the spaceships to go out and do it. They've shut down the shuttle program, which changes nearly the entire set of futures that I imagined back in the 1980s. Um, and you know, we're dealing with uh, a, a major recession, which I did kind of predict back in 2004, 2005 in Mariposa, I said, we're in very hard times, umpty ump years down the road, and, and here we are, uh, and, and sorry, in Quantico. In Mariposa, I pitched that, uh, that perhaps we were coming out of a, uh, a bad time economically, but we were going to face other challenges. Uh, the next novel in the series I am hoping to call Esperanza. And uh, you know, I think emerging out of the gloom is interesting because nearly all of my books for the last 30 years I've been fighting against this trend in American psychology and history toward rugged individualism versus community effort. And you know my friend David Brin has, has waxed enthusiastic and elegant about all of these different currents. But somehow back in the 1980s it became more and more and more this notion that we had to destroy community in order to preserve individual freedom. And we still see that today. You know, uh, community action, that's a nasty, naughty word. You shouldn't even say that. You shouldn't be building cathedrals. You should be building home theaters in your BMW studded home basement. You know, you should have a billion dollars and get away from the world and just do nothing but your own thing. You shouldn't be coordinated by society. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. And along the way, the political version of this kind of ran off with a lot of science fiction readers and fans and they became rugged individualists libertarians to a great extent, and I've always admired libertarians. My father-in-law, one of my favorite people, was a hardcore libertarian. Jared Pornell, another almost unclassifiable conservative, is an old-time friend of mine. And I watched uh, Jerry Pornell be kicked out of the conservative movement a few years ago. And I wondered, what the heck is going on? If Jerry isn't rugged individualist enough for these guys, then what are we dealing with? Well, what we're dealing with is America going through yet another paroxysm of the rebirth of old evils, and that's what I put into Mariposa. It's encoded language because a lot of people are still kind of 
um, sensitive about those issues, mostly white guys. <laughs> now, isn't that strange? But they really are, you know? And, uh, and as, I, as I, I go around looking for the coded language, I realize here's the coded language. If you're a libertarian and you believe that Robert E. Lee was a better general than Ulysses Grant, <clears throat> you got problems. Practical problems, psychological problems. If you believe that the Confederate battle flag is not a racist symbol, but a sign of you know, family honor and, and everything else, you've got problems. And in Mariposa, I lay it out flat out. If you're a conservative that believes in the honor of slaver culture from 150 years ago, you've got problems. You're dealing not with libertarian philosophy. You're dealing not with actual conservative philosophy. You're dealing with confederatism. You're dealing with the slaver culture. And the slaver culture rose up and trained people to be counter to act counter to their own best interests. It's really interesting. You see this in ant cultures, too. Believe it or not, look it up in E.O. Wilson. Ants that take slaves tend to slack off into nothing but becoming military. They become larger warriors and let the work be done by the slaves. And how is this not VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, and all that sort of thing? Remember, some of the finest generals and some of the finest fighting forces came out of the South. And so <clears throat> in the Union, you basically had a bunch of preachers coming down to become generals. But the military class has always tended to be with a slight Southern accent. How's E.O. Wilson inform us about that? So at the risk of offending everybody here, I have to say that in Mariposa, what we have is America returning to its senses by basically getting itself straightened out, throwing away the nightmares of the past, sometimes violently, and becoming really American again. And what is American? It is where community effort and individualism work hand in hand. It is where you are free, we hope, to do what you want to do for your own good and not for the demands of history of the past, where you are not blinkered by the propaganda that ran this country for 400 years. Now, how is that a thriller? Because in a situation like this, you can really devise a James Bond villain of immense proportions. It's just terrific. We've been set up for this in, in the United States over the last 10 years, such that in, in my basic principle is that we have met the enemy and he is us. Our James Bond villains are our own. They're not Smirsch. They're not anything like that. Talos Corporation, how is that not a James Bond name? Of course, anybody who's a Ray Harryhausen fan knows that Talos is the giant bronze figure that lords it over uh, Jason and the Argonauts. And in fact, I worked with uh, uh, some groups that had similar names uh, back in the 1980s, uh, advising uh, groups that were basically government service organizations. And I've been paid by government service organizations. And I kind of understand some of the psychology around the beltway of all of these things. But the whole notion of outsourcing everything in government to private industry was really intriguing. And then it went badly wrong. And it's still going badly wrong. Uh, the fact is that you don't give uh, civilians uh, authority over the basic principles of judicial life and, and, and liberty. You just don't. And you don't give them situations where they're being going to put, be put in wartime without accountability. You just don't. How did we end up that way? Well, seemed like a smart thing to do at the time. Now we're still pulling out of it. So that's where we get our James Bond villains nowadays, homegrown with our own nastinesses built in. And that's the kind of book that I, I'm getting tired of writing. I really want to move back into the science fiction of 2010. We're off to the stars. We're doing this sort of thing. Why are we mired in spending a trillion dollars on a war and killing thousands of people that we didn't really need to do? I've had conservatives tell me, well, we got rid of Saddam Hussein. Absolutely. That was totally satisfying. I thoroughly approve. We could have done it back in the 1990s if we'd really committed to that. But we didn't, perhaps wisely, I think, now. And why didn't we? Because we spent a trillion dollars and so far 4,000 lives. And what could we have done with that trillion dollars? We could have removed our allegiance to Middle East oil. We could have saved, uh, you know, we could have improved our security situation. We could have basically spent it on the sort of things we needed to spend it on. Instead, we've worked ourselves into debt. And now we're cutting all the visionary programs that we wanted to do back in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. They're starting to be winnowed out because we didn't focus. And why didn't we focus? Because we were told by other people lies to work against our own best interest, even our best interest as visionaries, 
We were told lies. And why did they tell us those lies? Because they wanted to justify actions and emotions and historical consequences hundreds of years old. Now, how is that not strange? How are we not still mired in that kind of thinking? How are we not persuaded by aristocratic slaver culture to work against our best interests? The prime metaphor of this whole irrational rambling that I'm going through here is most of the guys on the Confederate side who died at Pickett's charge did not own slaves. They did it for honor and state and family, supposedly. Why did they fight in that war in the first place? Because of states' rights. And yet, we're told over and over again by people who sympathize, it was all about states' rights. It was the right. That whole history was rewritten in the 1900s with financing from major universities and major Southern families, and the whole structure of the end of the Civil War was rewritten, and Reconstruction became this, that, the other thing. We were then told in history classes the Southern side of the story. And only in the 50s and the 60s did we emerge out of it. Very strange. How did that happen? How did we lose that war? Because for some reason, people who really value liberty get tired, get tired of having to fight the fight over and over and over again against people who lie and don't even know they're lying. That's a James Bond villain going up there. So in Mariposa, my James Bond villain is a major player. He's actually quite a charming and very intelligent fellow. He runs a major corporation in Texas. And in Texas, I wish, I wish that they had held off a little bit. The book was published last November. And suddenly in September uh, or, or August or back around that time in 2009, the governor of Texas says, why don't we secede? And that's what my book is about too. Of course, we've forgotten now that the first state that wanted to secede was Massachusetts. Back around 18, I think it was 1812. Massachusetts wanted to secede. And, and, and going that route was the end of a major political party, the Federalist Party. Because suddenly at the beginning of a war, here's a state that's proving itself to be unpatriotic. Uh, history is great. I love all this stuff. And I, I kind of throw this into the mix. And I, I kind of say that this is not the future I want to be born into. I got some messages recently talking about uh, uh, the Queen of Angels universe, Moving Mars, Heads, a series of books which I began writing back in mid-1980s to 1989 for Queen of Angels. And the structure of that is what we're heading into with Mariposa. Turned out that the political situation I was pointing toward fit perfectly with what was going on in Quantico, and so Mariposa introduces us to some of the characters who will show up in Queen of Angels and other novels later. Um, that surprises me. And what's also surprising is that some people went in and did the math, and I didn't do the math, and when I was writing Mariposa, it turns out that I'm way within the ballpark for all the character histories, the dates and everything, uh, which I don't actually name in Mariposa, but uh, it just fits perfectly. And, and uh, the one thing that doesn't fit perfectly is the space program, as speculated upon in Heads. By 2019, we've got you know, at least three families living on the moon in Heads. I'm not sure we're going to make that deadline. I'm not sure we're going to have a star probe out there by 2044 or whatever. I don't think we're going to quite make that deadline. And so back in 1969, I thought we'd actually be heading out to the stars by now. I was fully informed by the Arthur C. Clarke vision of the future. Why would this stop? Why would we pull back? Well, it turns out there was, in fact, a fairly decent reason for not doing so. The reason was we would have died. We didn't understand the technology and the biology. Why? Because we had simplified everything. Science is still, and to this day a lot of science, especially in the biological area, is stuck in steam engine versions of reality, where statistics and mathematics can describe these things quite well, rather than in the notion of, of a social neural network type of structure, uh, which is very tough to define mathematically. And uh, it turns out that space medicine wasn't far enough along for us to get out to Mars even, much less to the stars. We don't understand how biological systems operate in weightless conditions. We haven't done that much research yet. And so, quite literally, the, the future that I envisioned back in 1969 as a, as a growing nerd um, was much more difficult. And so there's a good reason for why we haven't gone into space. But the lack of resolve is also interesting. And I was just thinking this morning, we still haven't come up with an economic rationale for the future that we hoped for so desperately and so 
so wishfully back in the 1960s. We still haven't figured out how to do it monetarily. And what's worse, we haven't maintained the vision thing. Look at what's going on right now in, in our culture. We've got lots of big space movies with spaceships and technology and everything, and our space program is falling apart. The big screen TV replaced vision, true work in space. The big screen TV gives you all the space you want, starry fields, and you're comfortable, and you've got your potato chips, and there you are. You're happy. Ray Bradbury told us that, for God's sake, back in the 1950s. Fahrenheit 451, I'll get a third wall, big screen TV, and then I can be part of the family. When are we going to head in that direction? Ray Bradbury, supposedly a non-scientific visionary, wrote about virtual reality where we'd walk into a room and there would be the veldt. And the lions would be all around you and you could smell them, total sensory, and we're still heading in that direction. And what's it going to get us? What's it going to get us? when we have a completely realistic virtual reality system where you can have sex with any fake female on the planet, what's it going to gain you when you've got all of the experience and none of the reality? Well, as a member of the entertainment industry, I got to say I love this stuff. You know, I bought a big screen TV last week to replace an older one. Uh, and how do I devise my visions of, of our failure? I look inside myself. I look at my wishes and my needs, and I've actually got to say I'm not that fond of virtual reality. I've never actually immersed myself in a virtual, virtual reality environment. I'm sure it'll happen eventually. But 15 frames per second just doesn't do it for me. And Second Life doesn't do it for me either. And I think I have to say that Neil Stevenson agrees with me on that. And he doesn't talk much about Second Life. So what are we aiming for here? Why have we separated ourselves out with, with fantasy visions of reality, and yet we can't maintain this long term? notion of what humanity wants to do, what's it want to be. Are we still mired in the nightmares and the visions of 150 years ago? Are we still trying to fight those battles to resolve them? Why are we doing that? Did the propaganda wars that convinced America it was one sort of thing actually win, such that we keep dragging, our, dragging ourselves back like some, sort of, like, like some sort of ghost is pulling us back into the past? and we keep losing our track, losing our way, losing our understanding of what it means to be Americans? I'm tired of writing discouraging books. I'm tired of criticizing conservatism when, in fact, it should be the core of America. Why? Why are we still doing that? I don't know, really. Meanwhile, technology marches on. Entertainment industry is huge. We have uh, uh, Something approaching the virtual type, the visual typewriter that I wrote about back in the 1990s. Here was my vision of what would happen with entertainment. I was realizing back then that, that publishing was going to be in trouble in a few years because I saw a brain drain. I saw it by uh, talking to people at Microsoft. I saw it by uh, going to dinners with, with major players at Microsoft and other companies and realizing that New York came hat in hand to the West Coast to be told what was going to be happening in the entertainment world. And I actually saw that Microsoft hadn't a clue back then either. <laughs> they started making liaisons with big guns down south, and, and those liaisons were like watching rams butt heads with each other. And I had this vision that you know, what we really needed was really needed to, to find out what the Northwest and the West Coast had in terms of assets and coordinate them in a really interesting way and bring all that talent together and, uh, and, and start involving uh, uh, people who are already here confidently in what the future would bring. Why was New York publishing going to be in trouble? Because electronic publishing was going to come down the road soon. I, to, a, to a speech back in 1994 or thereabouts, I brought an a HP calculator that you could open up. And I says, this is the future of the, of the book. This screen will open up for you, and you can type on the bottom part on a virtual keyboard, and you can look at two pages of a book, and you can you know, open it out and watch a movie on it and everything. And this is going to provide competition for print books. Uh, but also competition was going to come from, and is coming from, not just television, not just motion pictures, but the gaming industry, whose revenues even back then were exceeding virtually every other branch of entertainment. And I said, this is going to cause a brain drain because publishing is typically poorly paid anyway, and New York is very snobbish. And New York will not recognize what's going on and will not change things, and so people will gravitate away, and the management, the most important people in determining how publishing goes, will get less and less capable, less and less business capable, and more and more mm, caught up in business trends 
uh, which they did. So newspapers had to make, you know, 20% profit or increase 3% every year. Books had to do the same thing. The secret masters of publishing, the giant conglomerates that bought up all the publishing industry, wanted these things to work the way real estate did. And look where we are now. In 2000, the publishing industry revenues dropped off 30% in one year. Sales dropped off. I don't know if revenues did, but sales dropped off 30% across the board. It was a huge shock. The shock waves went through, pressure was put on the editors, and the old joke suddenly became a reality, where the accountant looks at the list of books on one side that sell and the list of books on the other side that don't sell, and they say, why don't you buy more of the books that sell and not buy these? Well, of course, the joke is you never know which one it's going to be. You can't determine what the audience is going to do with a book. You can't do this. And the accountants ruled, the marketing departments ruled, and publishing is now continuing to drop off. We see it with mass market paperbacks uh, who had their distribution chains shut down. Now, I, I got to say, I was raised on paperbacks, paperback books. I still love paperback books. But you can't find them anymore except the top 10 bestsellers. You go into a lot of these stores and uh, that's all you're going to see up front is the top 10 bestsellers and that's like a supermarket putting milk up front. You know, that's not good marketing. You already read all those books. There's no selection. As you reduce the selection in a lot of bookstores, you reduce independent bookstores, the distribution chains shut down, Safeway only bought from one distributor regionally rather than 10 or 15. All those distributors went down almost overnight and were bought up and are now conglomerated, and now those sales are dropping off. The whole business was folding up and going away, and it's happening now in Hollywood, too. Even though they're making billions of dollars, they're terrified because revenue streams are going elsewhere. The challenge of the future in entertainment becomes as dicey as the challenge of the future in spaceflight and everything else. Where did we lose our vision? What did we want to do? What we wanted to do was end up independent, rich and isolated from society with no real responsibilities. This was the goal of the 80s and the 90s. And to some extent, we succeeded, except economically, we're on a downturn. The entertainment industry is suffering. All revenues are down. What went wrong? We lost our enthusiasm. The enthusiasm of being Americans was to create the future and provide huge, frighteningly visionary opportunities for our children so they'd be propelled into the sciences. How have we failed in that goal? We have been dragged back by the nightmares of history such that some of our most important emotional elements in American politics are now fighting wars that are 150 years old or more. And they're fighting them over and over and over again, slamming their feet down, trying to drag us back. They can't do that. On the other hand, the visionaries on all sides are kind of discouraged. The funding is dropping. VC is dropping. How are we going to start up new technologies, new revenues? Where is the vision going to come from? Uh, we're kind of holding on. We're trying to maintain our stand. In some cases, we've actually seen things happen. We've seen, you know, really major um, uh, changes in the way books are being delivered. And now they're fighting it over. The giants are fighting it over. And I say, that's great. That's the way business should be. They should be screaming at each other. They should figure it out. Uh, and I love my Kindle. And I would probably end up buying an iPad or a Slate or whatever you want to call it. I think that's great, too. I love all of these things. They're all delivery systems for content. But along the way, we've seen some very strange phenomena come out of the tech industry. We've seen the whole notion that, that content should be delivered for free because the Grateful Dead did it that way. You know the old metaphor. You know, if, if, why, why are you fighting people downloading all this music? Because, you know, what you can do is just put your band together and have live concerts. Yeah, that's tough for a movie industry to do. It's tough for writers to do. Thomas, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mark Twain uh, uh, used to do that and, and go around lecturing around the country. And Ray Bradbury still does it to some extent. Uh, but you can't make a living out of that anymore. So what about this notion that information wants to be free? Where did this delusion come from? Well, it is a delusion because it's, it's really not going anywhere. We're going back to the notion that, yes, information wants to be free, so do hamburgers. You know, But you can't download a hamburger. If we could, if we could go back to those 1960s science fiction novels where the replicating machine makes everything for you, didn't we try to do that with nanotechnology? Didn't we say in 20 years nanotechnology will make everything cheap because you'll just 
put your home factory to work, and it'll make a BMW for you. You just order it off screen. This was the vision we had. <laughs> How amazing was that? And when nanotechnology finally came to the fore, what we ended up with was what we ended up with when we went out looking for AI, when we went out looking for all of these things, uh, the, the, great, the great trends of the future, we downgraded them. Artificial intelligence, we said, was just a search for expert systems and, and not HAL. HAL, we said, oh, we may be there eventually, but we can't get there for now. So we'll just redefine artificial intelligence. Nanotechnology, machines that make smaller and smaller and smaller machines. And then, there we go, smaller and smaller machines. And, and it's just fantastic. And of course, that was biology, really. But we were looking for silicon because we didn't want to corrupt. We didn't want to die and, 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 and fade away and you know, turn into slime and that sort of stuff. So we wanted to be embedded in silicon. And the visionaries of the mid-1990s said, nanotechnology is going to be a giant star computing things to the end of time. You know, Robert Bradbury said this. It's a, it's a brilliant vision. He is related to Ray Bradbury, apparently. I don't think Ray would have approved. But where did that vision end up? All of nanotechnology is now confined to paint, cosmetics, golf clubs. And, of course, to writing very small things on silicon wafers. Meanwhile, biology is coming along and quite literally eating nanotechnology's lunch. Why? Because the original nanotechnology is the cell. It's a protein molecule with 60 domains of activity and 10,000 degrees of, of, uh, of freedom. And, and it, it can move at 10,000 cycles per second. And what the heck does it do? You can't compute it. With that many variables, you just can't do it on a computational system because the variables change as you compute them. Now, that means that we're having a hard time understanding what life is all about. But how's that any different from what it was back when I was a kid? We have to reorient ourselves. We have to think about where we really want to be. We have to stop looking upon ourselves as not being connected to community because most of us here have to work with other people to get things done. We can't just lock ourselves away, rich billionaires with catalogs full of nanotechnological items, and grudgingly you know, move ourselves like snails back into a, a vision of the past that never really worked, a vision of the future that never really works. So how are we going to do this? Where are we going to go from here? First of all, we have to get our economics straight. We have to get our priorities straight. We have to look upon ourselves as living in a world where there are a lot of bright people out there, but still, still, where what we have to offer is extraordinary. Our roots, in a real way, the, the cultural roots of America come out of an England full of people who love to argue with each other. And they would pull in different cultural elements from the, you know, the Bible to the Greeks to all of this stuff, and they'd argue about them. And they'd, they'd go off into weird areas and have wars and you know, set up empires. And I've got to say that if you wanted to be occupied, it was better to be occupied by the English and the Portuguese, but not much. And we went through all of that. And then we separated off from that. And we came over here. And we continued to argue. Argument is terrific. Lying is not. If you are in a situation now where you lie to yourself about your goals, your standards, your connection to the country, you are not doing us any good. And right now in our media, we have alternate camps setting up lying factories. That isn't good. We have the bloggers who have no fact filter whatsoever quite often. And really what you do is you have 10,000 people lying to each other and out of it emerges this giant cumulative lie. And that carries on and influences how our elections are carried out. We've always complained about people not being educated in voting, but people who are lied to and vote are really dangerous, too. I think Robert Heinlein actually found this out. One of the quintessential libertarian writers of the 1940s described a period of time he called the crazy years. We've been in the crazy years since the 1970s. When are we going to come out of them? And, and, and in his inimitable way, he started writing the headlines for the crazy years. And these headlines can be found on, <laughs> on, the, on the internet right now, every single day. Very similar headlines. How did we get there? Well, some respects we didn't listen to our best people. In other respects, we didn't listen to our inner heart. So as I work on books now, um, 
Mariposa is hopeful. Mariposa is about finally exorcising the ghost of the past. But it's also about facing up to the consequences of screwing things over. Quantico was about bad leadership leading to trauma for the people who put themselves in the front lines. It wasn't about you know, visionary thinking so much as it was about protecting ourselves. And when we put our protectors into tough and impossible situations, they get bent, they get broken, they get hurt, they die. And so you need to be careful how you use them. In Mariposa, it's when they come home, how do you fix them? PTSD. PTSD is, is going to be a huge problem coming out of all of these wars because we have the, the, the children of, of uh, baby boomers going off to wars as professional soldiers and not being treated all that well medically, psychologically, within the core even, when they come home, within the military. We, uh, we think if you're, if, you're, if you're a soldier, then suck it up, by golly. You're supposed to be brave. You're supposed to have courage. You're not supposed to come home and whine, are you? Oh, that's terrible. You're coming home and whining. How can you do that? So we George Patton all over them. And it doesn't help. 300,000 soldiers will probably have symptoms of PTSD. My best friend came home from Vietnam with PTSD, which he still suffers from. Um, he was in a driving rainstorm in California a, a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, and suddenly visualized he was back in the monsoons in Vietnam. And he started having an anxiety attack. That's 30 years, 35 years after he came home. What's going to happen to our soldiers? In Mariposa, the notion is that our troops, we have such a desperate need for PTSD that a treatment comes forward that could, in fact, show real promise. What it does is it takes all of the stops and all of the checks and balances that you have been socialized with, sometimes that, you have, been, that have been burned into your brain by experience, and erases them, leaves you emotionally a tabula rasa from which you can regrow and reestablish the pathways in your life that you want to follow, actually without the trauma. But it also, unfortunately, creates a set of individuals who are no longer socialized. They have to make decisions about how to behave. All of their long-term educational training and, and, and cultural training has been erased. It's like Jekyll and Hyde all over again. So you're liberated from PTSD to some extent. You don't feel that pain anymore. You're also liberated from the requirements of society. But you're also liberated from the limitations of your intellectual training. The stuff that you were told that you sucked up to, that you basically agreed to about your intellectual capacities, about your talents, your abilities, all of that is wiped out too. And suddenly we've got several hundred people including the Vice President of the United States, who have undergone this training, this therapy. He underwent the training secretly. And who are they now? They are the brave new world. One of them, my main character, decides that it's more interesting and more difficult to do good than to do evil. So he'll pursue that for a while. But it's purely an intellectual exercise. At what point? Can you find it more interesting to do the opposite? This is kind of a metaphor for America, isn't it? Liberated from Europe, pulled out of Europe, given our freedom to think of who and what we are on our own terms, we quite often go backwards and forwards. We, we have these things we need to be liberated from, the traumas of the past, the, the PTSD of history. But we also have that incredible potential if we could just figure out what we want to do. And that's why the end of Mariposa is so very important to me. Because our characters, my characters, who have been through hell because of bad leadership, who have survived the philosophy of our country and realized that bad kings kill the land, they go off on their own now and they're liberated. What are they going to do? Where are they going to go? They're like children again. They're like babies in the cradle, except they're fully grown and they're well-trained and they're very smart. And for them, the world is very, very new. I think this defines not only our problems, but our potentials. What the heck are we going to do now? There was a postcard, and I'll end on this note and we'll take questions, sent out by a science fiction fan, which I think had a deep influence on Sir Arthur Clarke back in his early writing days in World War II. The postcard went out, uh, I'm forgetting who it was now, someone, I think it was Claude Degler or someone like that, 
old science fiction fan, uh, fanzine publisher. <laughs> he sent this postcard off to all of his friends, and it says, I have a cosmic mind. What do I do next? And that's the end of 2001, isn't it? Well, we haven't acquired a cosmic mind yet. We don't know what that is. Is it liberation from self? Is it liberation from society? Is it ultimate truth? Is it being a star calculating mathematical things for the next 10 million years? What are you going to solve mathematically if the mathematics can't solve the problem? Where are we going to go next? Are we going to be in space? Are our bodies going to be in space? Will our minds be in space? Will we become star children? What will we be liberated from? Will we be criminals if we become like gods? What will we do? This is the problem Americans face. This is the problem science fiction has been wrestling with for well over 100 years now. H.G. Wells wrestled with it. We wrestle with it internally. Philip K. Dick wrestled with it. Arthur C. Clarke wrestled with it. You have a cosmic mind. What do you do next? Any questions? Yeah. You mentioned the Kindle. I'm curious about uh, an author's perspective on sort of digital distribution. Yeah. Whether you need publishers or whether authors would be happier selling direct, basically self-publishing through digital media like Kindle and the iTablet. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, the old the old question used to be used to be uh, you know do you self-publish and the old answer used to be no. That's ridiculous, because you got all these editors who can help you and publishers who are not to market your books and everything. That's less and less true. The publishers aren't buying authors, new authors in particular, are just aren't being picked up. They're having to go to small press publishers. And eventually, some of those small press publishers will emerge to become major players. But uh, meanwhile, you've got this distribution channel. Now, the only problem is, how do you reach 500,000 people to tell them your book is now available? or a million or 10 million or whatever. You know, YouTube doesn't quite cut it. The Kindle's a really interesting opportunity, and it's being, it's being you know, refined as we go along. It's purely a reading experience, which I find fascinating. I love my Kindle, because it doesn't do anything but provide a page of basic text. Everything else it's kind of bad at, and that's good, because I can read it for hours. It doesn't tire your eyes. There's no screen refresh rate. It's kind of, you know, wandering off into this slightly olive-colored universe of text. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very hopeful. Uh, on the other hand, it's going to take a while, and in that transition period, we're going to have people who are going to be pirating books because information wants to be free, and they could kill us, quite literally. Yes, sir? Uh, you talk about corporations taking over a major part of the U.S. government. Yes. Can you comment, comment on the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision that they can spend as much money as they want before an election? Oh, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I have a feeling that there are some corporations in the Northwest that were traumatized by the conservatives a few decades ago when one of them who went to Washington was told by a freshman House Republican, well, now you know who your friends are, don't you? Okay. I have a, I have a feeling that there will be a kind of matching point for point of, of uh, left and right, it's going to really screw things up. I think it's a bad decision. But the war is far from over. I'm just wondering how much people are going to want to spend on which candidates. We, found, we, just, we missed, missed a bullet with John Edwards, who had you know, the Mellon Foundation lady basically paying for his mistresses. That's very strange. How is that going to get perverted? You know, if you think artists are weird, look at politicians. Politicians are entertainers without, without a screen to be limited to, you know? That's going to be fascinating. We do this all the time. We screw things up so badly. And, uh, and, and then we manage to work it out somehow. So good question. Yes, sir? What do you think about the Google book search program? Uh, it's pretty amazing. I think there's, again, that there's some overreaching there. And when I gave a talk at Google up in, uh, uh, down in Santa Monica, I actually said, you know, guys, you've you got to share the wealth here. And if you're having our page views support your advertising revenue, then you've got to give authors a cut, just like libraries give authors a cut in Europe when their books are checked out. Um, you can't have the use of our copyrighted content earning you money without us getting something out of it. It doesn't have to be a lot. You know? And I think they're working toward that model now. If you contribute, um, Give, get a share. I also I think that's going to be true of almost all electronic distributions. We're not looking at models of, you know, the one thing that books managed to do was they managed to stay terribly expensive throughout the last 30 years while DVDs were dropping down to 10 cents each. I, it's not quite that bad, but five bucks each for a DVD when you go to Best Buy. You're not going to find a book that costs that much except in a used bookstore. 
That doesn't earn us any royalties. And a Blu-ray, a Blu-ray today, you can get one for 10 bucks. Books are still expensive. So that's why Amazon is trying to force it down to $10. And I think that probably if the author is publishing a book, I don't see why it can't cost $5. I, th I think it's a terrific possibility. And then suddenly, you could have a library of 50,000 books, and we'd all earn money. Right? Plus, there's all these free books out there, which is going to hurt the reprint industry. Dover Books is probably sunk right now. <laughs> Their books cost 30. I love Dover Books. I used to buy them all the time. Uh, they're 30 bucks now for a trade paperback. And the book is available on Google Books for free. So what's this going to do to reprints? Uh, the whole publishing industry has to rethink itself. On the other hand, there's been a lot of snobbery on the East Coast about the role of New York, Boston, in American literature and American history. The West Coast, far less snobbish. If things start moving over towards the West Coast, that might be a good thing. So we've got a lot of possibilities here. I wanted to also say uh, there's a couple of folks in the room who can't ask me questions because they've been giving me secret information that they're here to watch me carefully, not divulge. <laughs> My current project takes me very far away from American politics and off into uh, Arthur C. Clarke, Larry Niven uh, land uh, with Halo. And I'll be writing the origin story. And, and I'm still trying to struggle around the first few chapters because when you write about something 100,000 years ago, uh, that determines the entire history of the human race and the universe. Got to get it carefully, but they've been helping me out here. So, uh, What I also discovered when I came to Halo uh, a few years ago, uh, to, or rather to uh, Xbox, was that this model that I had wanted to do back in the mid-1990s uh, was pretty much what Xbox became. It was all the talent brought to the Northwest and taking over the entertainment industry. Now, how cool is that? So uh, you're not quite there yet. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you've still got movies like Avatar whisking out a, a swift one and a half billion dollars. <laughs> but the competition really is pretty light compared to the entertainment industries uh, going over to video gaming. The vision I had of video gaming back in those days was a little more abstruse. I wanted more women to play video games. And so I said, we should create you know, Proustland, uh, this kind of thing. And of course, The Sims kind of uh, picked up on that. And a lot of women play The Sims or Myst. I'm not sure what the breakdown is for Halo or the first-person shooter games or zombie games, but it's actually getting more and more women are playing these games. That worries me to some extent. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering you know, where they're going to get dates, the women, that is. But anyway, it's all cool stuff, and the technology is utterly fascinating, and I'm having to develop the thumb skills to write these books. Got time for a couple more questions, or are we good? Questions about anything having to do, here, here's my areas of expertise. When I was a kid, I, I loved Star Trek. I love special effects and motion pictures. I love comic books. I love science fiction. I love fantasy. And I loved H.P. Lovecraft and horror. Now, I was the only one in my high school, maybe three or four others, who really loved all that stuff. And of course, it now dominates the entire industry. So I'm not sure that my positive influence helped things. <laughs> But it's been my pleasure over the years to be sort of a Southern California boy getting insights into all of these areas by meeting the people, everyone from Ray Harryhausen to Ray Bradbury to, uh, you know, to then coming up here and being asked to put together the Science Fiction Museum, use all that expertise. So is there anything about science fiction or imaginative literature that you are ever curious about? Yes, sir. So I've, I've been a sci-fi fan for, you know, ever, basically. And it's, it's interesting to me that, like, the tenor of sci-fi has shifted from really pie in the sky, um, extremely hopeful, to space opera, to whatever, to then to Star Trek, which was exploratory, then office -y, right? Mm -hmm. And now it, the stuff that's coming out now has a much darker realist tone, it seems. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder what you see, you know, is sci-fi still an escapist hatch, or is it starting to really tie into the fact that we've got a complicated world that we're all living in. Brave New World, 1928, 29, pretty dark. Yeah. <laughs> pretty dark. H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, Food of the Gods, pretty dark. Island of Dr. Moreau, very dark. And bordering on horror, you know, sadomasochistic horror. Science fiction's always been back and forth between the bright and the, even Arthur C. Clarke. Some of his visions turn out to be kind of strange, like Childhood's End. Um, Really a strange ending. Are these humans anymore? You know? 
uh, Philip K. Dick. God, who am I? You know? And, 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 and how am I like Franz Kafka? Well, I'm not because I'm an American, but you know, what's going on here? What is memory? What is self? All these questions came up in the 1950s. Through the 1940s, we, we had a kind of a positive take um, in, in Astounding magazine, but there are a lot of critical, socially critical stories being published back then, too. I remember uh, in Analog in 1963, a story called, uh, um, by Rick Raphael, oh, I'm gonna, uh, Code 3, which was about America, uh, apparently without a fuel problem, oil problem, with cars on the highways, these super highways, 100 lanes wide, with cars that were 50 to 60 feet long, could travel 60 to 300 miles an hour on these highways. And the story is about the highway patrol that tries to keep you safe. Now, that's a cool idea. I'm still thinking of that. You know, how's that not a, uh, a Michael Mann movie or something like that? <laughs> but that's critical. So even Astounding and Analog frequently put out these story ideas that were critical. We still do that to this day. What I think we're noticing is that a lot of this is, is dark fantasy with a lot of psychologically questionable elements to it, such as, oh, serial killers are such romantic people. <laughs> Vampires, oh, they're so sweet, really, underneath. <laughs> and all they do is they suck pigs dry. You have all these mummified pigs lying around. I mean, it's, a, it's not a pretty sight when you're near a vampire village. What does it smell like? Bram Stoker knew what a vampire smelled like. I mean. <laughs> The only reason women would date Dracula is because he's very, very rich. <laughs> how does he get rich, though? He walks around finding fairy gold. And how's this not an investment banker? You know? <laughs> so investment bankers are vampires, aren't they? I mean, it's very, very clear. But we've always had back and forth on that. And, and if you want to read dark stuff, you've got to go back to the 1970s. Some of the darkest science fiction ever written was written back in the 1960s, 1970s by people like Michael Moorcock. And, you know, this is really dark stuff. So, and it was real science fiction. It wasn't just zombies and so on. Zombies. Mm. I don't know. Yes? Um, do you have any opinion on space elevators? you think it might it's be a cool a idea? Today or? Yeah, it's a cool idea. But again, that's where nanotechnology really has to come along. We need that molecular monofilament structure. <laughs> Nanotubes, carbon fibers, all this stuff are, are possibilities. But you need a shear ratio to get into orbit across your molecular bonds. You also need, uh, Robert Forward had some designs for uh, uh, survivable uh, knitting strategies, cord strategies, how you knit your, your long tubes into things that would survive a nick. And I think that stuff, some of it's been patented and there's you know, progress there. And we've had uh, competitions uh, from various Northwest geniuses where they've taken advantage of some of these space elevator competitions. So I like that. It's an interesting idea. It's a visionary idea that makes you think impossible thoughts. And I like that. Yes? Any thoughts on some of the developments recently in uh, brain imaging and the ability to have a, a lie detector that's effectively 100% mm. you know, accurate and you know, brain reading and so forth? Yeah, the Homeland Security really wants this, along with facial identification software that can pick a face out in the crowd that has dire thoughts. You know, uh, and I understand it makes their job easier, but on the other hand, you've got all these cameras and you don't have that many people. We're not China. You know, China has 60,000 people just watching you download porn. But we don't do that here. We only have, you know, three or 400. So watch it. But, but um, could you do it? We, we don't understand how the brain works. We do understand how certain individuals can function in certain ways. Brain imaging is, is really still more of an art form, just like lie detector tests are. And you can pass by training your brain, your brain differently. So if we had you know, brain imaging software that worked, then no doubt the terrorists would come along and say, well, think kind thoughts about pussycats. Think lolcats as you're walking through the airport. And you got these, all these happy brain images coming through, and that would really worry Homeland Security. Wait a minute, everybody's happy. They're all thinking about lolcats. Didn't we see this in uh, um, um, Village of the Damned? Where in the end, he's surrounded by all these creepy blonde children who are trying to read his thoughts. All he comes up with is a brick wall. You know, think of what he would have done if he could have had law cats instead of a brick wall. <laughs> Great fun. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it, it's, again, it's an interesting problem. But we, uh, we are trying to find easy solutions to really complex social issues. And I think the money you spend on this kind of research 
could perhaps equally well be spent on trying to, to uh, educate and uplift uh, the societies that are causing us these problems. Basically, they're poorly educated. Their opportunities are very, very poor. They're very uh, patriarchal. And so someone like uh, uh, Greg Mortensen really has a really good solution. And finally, the military is paying attention to that. And they're co-venturing, which I think is fabulous, which is to build schools and educate women. When you do that, terrorism starts to go away. Maybe we can stop them before they get here. Yes, sir. So you talked a lot about the, the changes in society in, in these two, in the two books on Quantico. Um, a lot of your consulting work as well, sir, plays into this. Uh, the, uh, the ongoing uh, tug of war between um, security and privacy and the, ver the diametrically opposed opinions that continually surface. Do you touch on that, any of this, or what are your thoughts around that? Uh, in the book, certainly, yeah. Uh, this notion of security and, and freedom not necessarily working together. That's why I think some of our, our uh, best nerd libertarian groups still have great functions to perform, which is they're always screaming about lack of freedom. We need that uh, there. We need, we need your rational concerns about freedom to keep us from going over to the dark side of, oh, I'm safe and I'm surrounded by, by a bunker. I can't move. But the bunker has cameras. So... Yeah, I think that's, uh, it's still a fight we have to fight. Uh, in terms of, of protecting us, seeing Homeland Security from the inside, I have to disagree with a lot of people who say they're all incompetence and they're all, you know, they all want to take over and they all want to destroy our freedoms. That's not true at all. These guys are really hard working. They make mistakes. They have to because their job is impossible. And TSA, cops on the highway, patrol cars, all this stuff, I never give them guff. Why? Their life is hard enough. Even if they're a little overbearing, put up with it. One of you last screamed out loud in frustration in private. You know, they don't have much privacy when they're working. So a lot of these issues are about how we train, how we coordinate, and not about technology. The technology may be useful at some point. Certainly the cameras are useful. I, I got to say, I don't feel that, that the having CCTV systems reduces my personal freedom. Not sure why. I don't feel that the Google Street View causes me great concern. But I could be wrong about that. You know, there could be a point at which, and, and in, in Queen of Angels, I have all of these cameras are available, and all the information is available, and it's recorded, but you have to have a court order if you're law enforcement to get access to it, because it's a public enterprise. It's not uh, a federally funded thing. It's a public enterprise, and the court order allows you access to all this information. I think that's an interesting model. It's there. But you have to have a really good reason to narrow down, you know. Of course, our cameras now are in houses. In, in Quantico and Mariposa, my law enforcement people have 6K cameras in their eyeglasses. You know, your whole life is recorded. And I got to say, having scanned all the photos that I took, to, you know, uh, with film cameras back through the 1980s and 90s, a lot of that stuff really isn't that interesting. <laughs> so what are you going to watch? Yeah. So well, on, on that topic, have you read David Brin's Transparent Society? Yeah. Where he does the opposite from what you're saying. You need a quarter order. Everybody has everything. Do you think that's a... I think his point of view is actually very good. I, I agree with David that anonymity is the problem. This notion that I want to say anything I want and still no one will know that I said it, it's nasty. It's really nasty. You know, Twitter, all this stuff, if it's anonymous, I don't care to listen to it. And so the society is basically, I think the society should say, if your name isn't attached to it, no one reads it. Yeah. Yes, sir. You mentioned court orders. The man in charge of Microsoft Health Products says in his life he's given out 15,000 health records on, under subpoena. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, but of course that's under FISA and all this other stuff, which has gotten really dicey in the last 10 years. Uh, the, these, these things need to be refined. They need to be inspected by a non-conservative dominated court. Uh, we need to have public discourse about this that isn't traumatized by this historical being persuaded that we need to work against our own best interests to support some one goal or another. We have to go back to being true Americans, which is skeptical, searching for the truth, finding the truth, learning how to recognize the truth, not lying to each other, and working for common goals for the common good so that our kids can grow up with a visionary world to live in. Yes, sir. 
If you were Steve Baldwin, where would you have Microsoft focus its efforts to bring about the future that you would envision? It'll cost you. <laughs> no. uh, over the years, I've actually been in, you know, kind of in and, in and out of, of talking to all these people, not Mr. Balmer, uh, but I had dinner with Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking once, and that was really interesting. Nathan Mirvold set that up. Uh, we hang out occasionally with, uh, with Rick Rashid and Terry Rashid, and, and we talk about all sorts of cool stuff. And Rick doesn't give me any great secrets, uh, but, but we talk theoretically about things. And, uh, you know, and, and over the years, I realized that in the Northwest, our billionaires are among some of the very best billionaires ever. I mean, they still, they still can cause problems, uh, but, but nevertheless, I like them. They're nearly all science fiction fans. <laughs> and that gives me hope. Now, I don't know about Mr. Balmer. I, I don't know whether he reads science fiction, but I know that Paul does, and Bill used to. And, uh, you know, and, and Jeff certainly still does. Jeff started off me, like me being a Trekkie. Uh, and, and so all this stuff I have hope because they read science fiction. I hope they're not reading zombie books now. But to Mr. Balmer, I would say, yeah, uh, you know, uh, this corporation still is capable of changing the world. But it can't do it safely. It can't do it on a two-year agenda. It has to think 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And in some respects, it is. This department is one of the most interesting parts of Microsoft. Microsoft research, Rick Rashford once bragged to me that, that we're doing everything, we're researching every single technology that was in Star Trek, he says. <laughs> and I'm wondering where you've got the matter transporter right now. <laughs> where, where's your, your, your fly strip? you know, uh, filter system there. But yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff being done here. I would say look to Microsoft Research um, and, and to this international cooperation thing where you're around the world providing very intelligent people access to funding, to uh, encouragement, and to uh, uh, working with Americans. By God, we need that. We need to get rid of this notion, you know, that, that immigration and, and crossing borders is a nastiness that's going to bring us down. We, you know, jo outsourcing jobs, yeah, it, it can be a real problem. But on the other hand, you know, it's one world. In the science fiction community, it's always been one world. And as I look at India now, I'm getting, I get messages from fans in India, science fiction fans, that remind me of the 1950s. They're trying to put together community. They're trying to put together visionary things. They, they come over here and they say, what was science fiction like in the 1950s? Because you know, we're there. What do we do? How do we? Uh, our spiritual influence is tremendous if we're not mired in the past. If we don't go back to all of our old hatreds and the, the philosophies of slaver culture and all that stuff that say, you know, suspicion, hatred, fear, that's how we get our political agenda going. If we avoid all of that, we can once again be a beacon light in the world. And I think the opportunity lies slumbering here at Microsoft, and sometimes it breaks out into flame. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs>